wonder, when was the last time you speci specifically remember noticing that you'd seen love in action? In all honesty, I think it happens way more than we probably notice. And asking God to give us eyes to see love in action is one sure way of leading an encouraging life. I'm not saying it was the last time, but one recent memorable time I saw love in action came over the bank holiday weekend at the start of last month. A dear member of our church family, Chris Lord, who's been increasingly frail through these last COVID years, was in hospital. And it was becoming clear that she was nearing the end of her life. Chris and George's children both live hundreds of miles away. They'd been down and would come again, but on that particular day, they couldn't be there. And I was incredibly moved to see how a member of our church family, another Chris, set aside whatever plans he may have had for his bank holiday to be there for George so that he could sit with his beloved Chris. I actually remember thinking, now that's love in action. And it's a beautiful thing to see, to recognize, and to affirm when we see it. By the way, Chris's Thanksgiving service is happening here in church at 2.30 this coming Friday, so do join us if you would like to. Well, after weeks of journeying with Paul through his letter to the Romans, grappling with some profound spiritual truths along the way, today we've come to the last in our sermon series, these fabulous verses from Romans chapter 12 that Mary's just read to us that have so much to say about love in action. They're the sort of verses that you can read again and again and just feel inspired by the simple, practical energy they evoke. Paul gives us a rooted, no-nonsense vision of what Christian living is all about. To be honest, there's so much in them that it's simply not going to be possible to plumb their depths this morning, but I can, and I will pick out a couple of themes. Themes that have to do with the choices we make and the attitudes we hold. I've read this passage through several times in the week as I've been thinking and praying about what to say this morning. And the thing that stood out for me the first time I read it at the start of the week was the number of times Paul uses the word evil. I have to admit it came as a bit of a surprise. It wasn't what I was expecting in a passage that's headed up love in action in my Bible. So here they are. Verse 9, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Love in action is expressed in the choices we make. And far from being something insipid or bland, the sort of love that Paul's talking about has strength and depth and a kind of gritty determination to do what's right and to do what's good. Hate what is evil. Cling to what's good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And it's important to recognize when we're thinking about this battle between good and evil that we're not just talking about something that goes on out there. I'm sure we've all known times when the battle's intense right here in our own hearts in our own minds. That's why we need all the help we can get to give us the hope of making good choices. Because let's face it, it isn't always easy, is it? We need the resources of heaven to help us in the choices we make. And the brilliant news is that we have them. So when Paul says in the opening verse of today's passage that our love is to be sincere, He's not talking about us pretending we feel something we don't. In fact, sometimes it can be really important for us to be honest with ourselves and with God about what we do really feel deep down. What Paul's actually saying is that the sincerity of our love isn't about feelings at all. It's about the things we do. It's about our actions and our choices. So whatever we might or might not feel, 
When we choose to behave towards someone as though we really did love them, we often find, much to our surprise, that a genuine level of compassion, care and concern for them quickly springs up. It's a mystery, but I can tell you from experience that it works. Because God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. When we open ourselves up to receive and to live out of the life and love of God, somehow we're transformed in that process. And the same is true when it comes to our attitude to and the choices we make in the face of suffering. Paul writes this in verse 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And this is a verse that's become particularly meaningful to me in the wake of a personal family situation these last few years. Back in the autumn of 2019, my sister's middle child, Faye, was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. She was just 33 years old and she had two young children under four and a potentially pretty bleak prognosis. From the start, I was amazed at the courage, positivity and hope that I saw in Faye as she embarked on what was to be a really daunting and gruelling schedule of treatment. She had incredible support from her family and from the health professionals. And she also had incredible support from a whole host of people she never knew, some of whom are here now. I was humbled by and so grateful to my friends here at St. Michael's who took Faye into their hearts and prayed faithfully for her healing and restoration. It really was love in action in a beautiful way. It made me feel loved. And it was absolutely wonderful news when we heard on Christmas Eve, 18 months ago, that Faye had been given the all clear. A few months later, Faye's dad, Stephen, my brother-in-law, recorded a testimony that was played at their church in Eastbourne. This was in lockdown times. And in it, he read a message from Faye, a message that included this Bible verse. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. It was a verse that had held and carried Faye through her treatment, and I really did see how she lived it out. And maybe it'll be a verse for someone here today going through a tough time. There's so much more that could be said about these early verses in our passage. Paul's call for us to be devoted to one another in love, to honour one another above ourselves, to share with the Lord's people who are in need, to practice hospitality. So much more that could be said and not enough time to say it. But I really would encourage you to take these verses away and to read them again and again in the coming days and just see what God has to say to you through them. Because honestly, there's been more than one situation that's cropped up in my life this week where putting Paul's practical advice into action has made a difference. But for now, I want to focus on the verses towards the end of the passage and particularly what Paul has to say about revenge. It's a good service, isn't it? Evil, revenge. <laughs> Someone's likened the, the, the desire to take revenge to being like a deep itch somewhere inside us, right down inside us. And they said that newspapers know that if we can't scratch that itch for ourselves, then we like reading about someone else who could and did. It's a sad indictment on our society, but I do think there's some truth in it. But what Paul's telling us here is that as Christians, we need to find a different way, a better way to deal with the problem. Because revenge isn't an option. Instead, we need to find creative, surprising new ways of dealing with people when they've hurt us. Ways that might feel counterintuitive, but ways that bring life, not death, to our souls. Here are some of the nuggets that Paul throws out. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. 
Now, don't get me wrong, it's not about going soft on evil, pretending that it doesn't hurt, because sometimes it does. Evil is real. Often it does hurt, and sometimes very badly indeed, and sometimes in a way that can have a lasting impact. It does matter. But here's the thing. When we refuse to take revenge, when we make that deliberate choice to say no to it, what we're actually doing is taking responsibility for our own mental and emotional health. We're not allowing our future to, do, to be de determined by an evil that someone else has done. And when we do that, we become empowered. We take away the power of another to keep us in a bitter and twisted state. And that has to be good, doesn't it? Whether it's in the little things or the big things, the choices we make about how to respond to the stuff that happens, stuff that hurts, well, these choices matter. So when someone misunderstands, misjudges, misrepresents us, lets us down, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to get defensive to justify ourselves, to make a point? Now, again, don't get me wrong, there's a place for speaking up and for correcting misinformation. But it's how we do it with what attitude that I'm speaking about. I know that I can be inclined to be overly defensive in a way that's not always healthy. And it can be very exasperating for my husband, Chris. And actually, I've come to recognize in recent years that sometimes there can be a passive aggressive edge in what I say and what I do. And I have to say, that's not something I'm proud of. But at least now I've recognized it. I have a chance to do something about it. I can choose my attitude. I can choose to make that conscious choice not to repay evil with evil, not to take revenge. Verse 18, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It isn't always possible to live at peace with everyone because it takes two to make peace. But we can make peace in our hearts if not in our relationships. And we do this by choosing to let go of our hurts, choosing forgiveness over revenge, choosing to bless and not to curse those who wrong us. It's not the way of the world, but it is God's way. And it's a good way. It's the best. And we see it lived out so powerfully in Jesus, don't we? Remember those words he spoke as he hung on the cross, battered and bruised, taunted and mocked. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. What grace, what humility, what courage Jesus showed. And you know, people notice when things are done differently. Think about the response of the Roman centurion who witnessed all that unfolded. He saw Jesus' compassion and mercy towards the criminal crucified alongside him. He saw him take care of his mother in that crucifying moment. He saw him breathe his last as he committed his spirit into his father's hands. And seeing what had happened, the centurion praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. The reality of evil in our world, in our lives, isn't going to go away until Christ comes again and the kingdom of God is ushered in, in all its fullness. So no wonder Paul gives us such strong counsel to learn and to find ways that will ensure we make good choices, that we do all we can not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. Ultimately, we have to trust God to deal with evil in his own way and in his own time. Paul tells us that we're to leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. It takes courage, it takes grace, it takes humility. 
But if we make that choice to go out of our way to do positive, uncalled for acts of kindness to those who've wronged us, then who knows what God will do with it. It may even open the way for someone to come to believe in Jesus for themselves. We have no way of knowing, but in the week I found myself wondering whether the Roman centurion who witnessed Jesus' death on the cross may have even in later life become a member of the church in Rome, the very people to whom Paul was writing this letter. Who knows? It's a nice thought, isn't it? So as we come into land, I wonder what God may have been saying, been highlighting for you this morning. Maybe there's someone that you're finding difficult to love. And it could be time for you to be honest about that with yourself and with God, to recognize the need for God's help to choose to act in that loving way so that your love may be sincere. Maybe you're going through a tough time right now, and what I said about that verse that meant so much to my niece, Faye, resonated with you. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Maybe that's a verse for you to take away today and to live it out, knowing that you need God's strength and help to do it. Or maybe you're in a situation where you've been wronged, you've been hurt, you've felt let down. It's the easiest thing in the world to want to get our own back, to seek revenge. It's a sort of natural response of our sinful nature. But you know, and you've seen that there's a different way, a better way, And today you want to choose your attitude to find a way to make peace in your heart about what's happened. Or maybe you simply need and want a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. I said earlier, we have access to the resources of heaven. Grace, humility, courage, the things we saw in Jesus. He wants to give them to us so that we can face all that's going on in life. At the end of the service, in our last hymn, and at the end, members of our prayer ministry team will be available at the front of the side aisle. So if you'd like prayer for anything that God's been speaking to you about this morning, or anything that you have brought that you've carried with you, then they'd be happy to pray with you. But let's pray together now. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for all that you did to make it possible for us to live differently to find a better way to live, a way where we're not overcome with evil, but we have the power, the riches, the resources of heaven to overcome evil with good. So strengthen us, Lord Jesus, as we live for you in this week up ahead. Help us in the choices we make, the attitudes we carry, to honour you in all we do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.